Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another week of Showtime with Jordan Von Haslow on Hot 702.5 FM, Las Vegas. Today, um, I have a very special friend joining us, um, Dr. Adam Ghani, all the way from the UK. Thank you so much. I know the time Thanks. difference is a bit of a... <laughs> Is a, is, a, is a bit much, but I'm so happy you're joining us and I'm so happy um, to chat with you. So, you know, the whole premise of this show is, is, is you know, entertainment, right? I bring on friends of mine who work in the business, yeah. um, whether they're like performers or they're writers or, you know, they're, you know, work as, I don't know, key grips, you know, best boys on film sides. And just to talk about things, talk about pop culture, talk about what's going on. Um, but from that insider's perspective, necessary, you know, per se, I should say. Um, but you sort of fall out of that realm because you're an academic. However, the way that I, the way that I, 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 I first met Adam uh, is that he popped up in the explore page of my Instagram feed. And I can't remember now. A, it was a clip from a soap opera, and I'm a big, as everyone knows, I'm a big soap fan. And I thought it was great, and I thought that the commentary below was really great. And I went to the page, and everything on your feed was, like, amazing. And I never, ever, ever do this, but I actually slid into his DMs and said, oh, my goodness, <laughs> your feed is my life. <laughs> And the conversation just began for there. But so first of all, congratulations and um, on, a, on an awesome feed. I think your feed is probably one of the best feeds I've ever seen. And I never miss it. I okay. never miss it. I never miss it. So and you guys can check them out at uh, Adam T. Ghani, G-H-A-N-I, uh, yeah. uh, on Instagram. You'll have to check it out. So thank you again for joining us. So let's start with the feed. And then I want to talk a little bit more about... Um, about you and and about and about your work in academia. Um, so how did it, how did how did you even start uh, putting the feed together? Was it something that accidentally happened, or you just kind of posted something and people said, "Oh, that's kind of cool," so you just continued on, or did you like actually start with the intention of um, uh, uh, I want to put this together and this is what I want it to look like, etc. Yeah, I think what I did, I always wanted to see something online it, um, that was something that I liked, you know, in the sense that um, I first, everyone was on Instagram for years and years and years, and I never kind of joined the, joined the movement, I was about to say, until, you know, quite late in the game, 2018. And I just thought, so most people post uh, their snapshots of their lives or, you know, apart from selfies and stuff, you know, where they are, where they're going, what they're doing. And I just I just thought I want to be part of that kind of a fringe of Instagram that just posts what my interests are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just did it for myself, really. I just said, oh, this is great. This is like a little page where you can kind of curate. It's almost like a diary. It's yeah. Like, you know, I suppose in a diary, you'd put what, what, you're do what you did that day, what your emotions were that day, or whatever, how you're feeling. I express what's on my mind through the various clips or, um, you know, various still pictures. So it just, it just built from there. It's, it's almost like even if I only had two followers, I'd still keep at it because I just want something that I can go back, go back and uh, look over from time to time and just kind of pick up the threads of what really um, fascinates me. Yeah. Uh, there's kind of recurring themes in there that really kind of speak to my nature. Like, obviously, there's the propensity for kind of melodrama and um, interpersonal relationships. It's always people, all the clips of people, whether it's kind of a soap opera or a film, it's always people talking and it's usually about kind of relationships or kind of where the conflict between characters. Um, so yeah, I just think it's great because it's like a kind of, um, I think the word is polyphonic, you know, and it's multiple perspectives. And I just like this kind of notion of having all these different personalities kind of being showcased. Yeah. In a huge curated archive. Yeah, you know, and that's, that like, I think that that's what I love about it and what speaks to me about it. You know, like, you know, I, I primarily I'm a vocalist, right? But I yeah. also have spent yeah. a lot of time as a writer, specifically writing for soaps. 
And um, and what I love more than anything is are those interpersonal relationships. And and you know what I what I find about that particular genre, and you also find it in the live stage as well, right? Say yeah. versus like action films, is that you know it's not about what's happening. It's like literally about, okay, how are these people interacting with each other and what's really the subtext behind yeah. them and what's, you know, really make it go on. I mean, I remember just the training, like when I was writing, um, had writing Our World, you know, and and I, I, I learned how to soap write from this wonderful writer named Susan Sojourna Collier. Yeah who um, used to write it. She at one point wrote for like basically all of the ABC soaps. So she wrote across Port Charles and General Hospital and All My Children. And I don't know, I don't know if she ever hit One Life to Live. She might've hit One Life to Live at some point, but she kind of at some point. That was know, always, um, that one was always like, they call it the redheaded stepchild because it was kind of overlooked in the lineup. Totally. But arguably it's the one, if you look over its history, it's the one that has dated the best like it's really contemporary now because it was dealing with themes in its history that kind of all of pop culture deal with now, but it was re it was always the innovative. Anyway, I went off on. Well, no, but you no, but you're right, and that's that's Agnes Nixon. I mean, Agnes yeah. Nixon was the queen, and it's so. What I really hate is that soaps have such a bad rap. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of crappy writing, and there's a lot of, and a lot of that just has to do with the the production schedule, right? And the fact that it just has to happen so quickly and it, and there's not a lot of time to like, you know, you, you have to just go. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you, like you say, all of those themes, I mean, I think One Life to Live was the first to, like, you know, they dealt with uh, the woman passing, was it named Carla yeah. Gray, passing for oh, white. Right. Um, they had the, I think they had the first gay kid on television. I believe that was in the Ryan Phillippe yeah. Hall. Long, I think like the 80s. That's right. I mean, all my children had the actress from um, Angie as a lesbian in the eighties, but it was short lived. Angie became a lesbian. It was yeah. Honestly, I can't remember what the character was called. But <laughs> Arc, where she was like a doctor in Pine Valley Hospital, and she was a lesbian, and she was explaining to um, Donna about you know that she's no different from anyone else, and Donna was like kind of talking to her kid gloves. But yeah, I think the Ryan Philippe character was the first one where it was like a main it was like long-term storyline that wasn't dropped yeah. So yeah one life to live for sure and 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 i think that people and so i was saying i really hate that soaps get such a bad rap yeah um just because they as an as an as a genre they really were at the forefront of like bringing you know social issues mm to light, right? And we're the first things to really get people talking about certain things that, you know, now, like, again, we take for granted. Like, yeah. I believe it was, um, what show was it? Like, you know, again, I think it was, didn't uh, Erica Kane had an abortion and like, they turned that into like a real story and, you know, and like, and they really explored it. Um, I believe when um, Agnes Nixon was writing for, it might've been Another World, was it, the importance of like, well, she, I think she did like a breast cancer story. I think they had to like talk. Very guiding light where um, the Churita Bauer matriarch character, she had a pap spare. There you go. It, it made the public kind of aware that they had to get checked out, the women in the audience. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the fact that they were able to do it, I mean, they had to talk around the issue, but to still make it happen. And to and that goes again about that interpersonal experience. I was, oh, I know what I was saying. I was saying, so like I learned, I, I studied soap writing with this wonderful writer, Susan Sojourner Collier. And I remember just when we were like do at writing exercises, yeah. it would literally be like, you know, we'd have like a, she'd give me like a theme for a, a scene. Yeah. And I would have to say like, write like a two minute scene. And then she's like, okay, so now, from that two minute scene, what's at the pinpoint of that? So yeah. take these, if these two, if this back and forth, these three lines are the pinpoint of that. Now stretch those three lines out into another two minutes and really get even deeper into what's going on. All right. So now take these three lines now that you've done that and keep getting deeper, which is yeah. again why soaps extend for so long. I think the record was another world. I think they had like one day, it lasted like 31 episodes <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> but but no, so I think that that's why it speaks to me. So I think we're very much similar in yeah. in, in terms of in terms of that. So now, does that come about from your studies? So now I know you have your, your you have your PhD. So what was your undergrad in? Um, well, basically, I came out of 
I did a, my BA was in English literature and theatre studies, and then I did a master's in fine art, and then that segued into this PhD, which kind of combined everything. So it's kind okay. of interdisciplinary uh, subject, really. Um, but I, I, I think it ties into what we were saying about the emphasis on kind of personalities, personae, and um, how certain figures are really um, compelling to us. You know, just the personality of a, of a character kind of can spark off something that's huge in an audience, you know, can really spark off a kind of, um, uh, can really start a wave, if you like. So uh, where am I going with this? Um, so I'd say that my interest in the American soap operas particularly is that all the characters are very archetypal mm -hmm. in the sense that they're very kind of mythical. And it's my interest is I like naturalism, but I also like that kind of mythical quality, which like is... Like where you have like the hero, the yeah. damsel, the dress, the villain. Kind of, and also kind of um, just the evocation of, of it in the sense that you have like the sun god hero and then the kind of femme fatale. Yeah. The wise crone, you know, and just that, that kind of that, that more primal uh, way of looking at drama, which is ancient, which like, you know, the ancient Greeks kind of did all their plays, which are very kind of dramatic, melodramatic, that kind of primal, um, I think it's kind of metaphysical because it's kind of, they always evoke the gods. So I think that's where my interest in it um, lies. That's the kind of the, the root of my interest is this kind of mythical quality to, because when they do a lot of close-ups and stuff, and I think that you can really get to the soul of a character through mm -hmm. that, and you can't get that in big budget. Well, you can, but the kind of, the kind of big budget films where the world is more important than the actual person. Right. So big budget films, it's all about kind of presenting a world, mm -hmm. a spectacle. And I'm more interested in a kind of, interpersonal um kind of intimate uh interior world yeah and so this segues i think into why because you were saying you're wondering why soaps get such a bad rap and i think it's because they kind of um present this interior world and most people are not interior people mm -hmm. they, they uh, people of the world you know it's about kind of exploring outside right and like kind of reacting to what's going on without you as that's opposed it to, yeah and kind of the heroic story is the story of is the exterior so it's usually the male point of view the man's adventures through the world and the the kind of the epic quality it's about events whereas the historically the female narrative is about emotions and about that interior life Mm -hmm. because historically she has been kind of um, contained within a kind of domestic sphere, um, not afforded the same kind of uh, liberties. And it's given kind of the, the female kind of perspective, such kind of depth of character, I think. Yeah. Well, what's interesting, because like every now and then there have been like, shows that have attempted to kind of do that from the male point of view and they don't like I don't know if if it ever aired um in in the UK there was a show called Men of a Certain Age and it starred Ray, Ray Romano and I forget who else um and it was a really good show and it was really this quiet yeah. drama about conversations and it was like these three men who were friends and they were all kind of like you know one's going through like a really heavy midlife crisis yeah. One's like trying to like reconnect with their son. One's trying to, and it was it was really that, and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't, it never caught on. And I know that the the um, I worked for Time Warner at the time. It was an, on 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 um, TNT. Yeah. And I know that they really like the 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 staff and the execs really loved the show, and they like really pushed the show. And I think they aired it for longer than they normally would have aired another show. Yeah. Just because. So I think it's interesting how. <clears throat> You know, like you say, like women um, aren't necessarily afforded uh, that same luxury to be as external, et cetera. But I yeah. kind of say the same for men, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, I actually think the, the kind of a, 
in terms of like the limitations, I think it's shown a great depth. So I think there's a great, I think there's, there was an advantage in the kind of, in the soap opera format in the sense that it was, it was showing a nuance of character. Yeah. Outside narratives can never tell because they're so, they're so concerned with events. Right. Like all of like primetime television was about, um, you know, what was it? It was like Miami Vice and mm-hmm. all of those shows were kind of uh, very, very masculine kind of high energy shows. And I think the, the daytime soap opera, it slows everything down. Mm-hmm. You get, you get, a, it's more rich for an actor to play because you get more um, emphasis on kind of the person themselves. The, yeah. And versus the plot. It, it's changed. Obviously it's become more, it's become more like prime time. But my theory about why it's so disrespected is because of that kind of femininity, that feminine mm-hmm. quality. Um, emotion is looked down upon. It's perceived as, I mean, in this country, they call it... But, girl. like, it's perceived as, like, weak and... It's perceived like, as, yeah. yeah, it's perceived as sentimental, and sentiment is looked down upon. Romance, uh, anything that's about feelings instead of just, um, you know, reason... And I also think it's disrespected because the stories never end. And I think most people want to, when they perceive a work of art, it has to have an, it has to be a complete thing. It has to be finished, right? Like it's like it you get it. because men men want to quant- quantify it and want to kind of like say what's the quality of this, um, what's the quality of this piece? Because if it's something that doesn't end, it's ambiguous because you don't quite know what it's you know you don't know if you want to align with it because it can never end. Right. I think it's the ambiguous, ambiguous factor of um, daytime drama. Which, That's really interesting that yeah. you say that, though, especially because, again, the, the ambiguity. In it. And I think that maybe like you're really onto something in the sense that I think a lot of right entertainment is escapism. Right. And the world is so, you know, ambiguous. Life is so ambiguous. You yeah. have really, you know, even if you think you have control over a lot, you really don't, as everyone's learning yeah. now in this environment. And so maybe that's what the thing is, it's unsettling. It's like, oh my God, I don't, I can't even control this. I, I can't, like you said, yeah. quantify this. I can't. So it's like, screw this. This is, the, this, this, that defeats the reason why I'm even <laughs> watching this in the first place. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And the, the characters kind of, um, they're just very, it's the domination, dominant figures in, in the soap are usually the w- woman because the woman's emotional kind of impact is so powerful yeah. uh, within the narrative. Because um, I suppose even even on something like you know The Young and the Restless, you know Victor's storylines are usually him reacting to the women in his life. Mm-hmm. He, he has his business storylines and stuff. But you can never get to the kind of you can never get to the power of his character unless he's either reacting to one of his wives or his daughters. Oh you know, yeah. In life. So when Eric Braden gets to be vulnerable, it's like when Nikki was um, had her back injury. I don't know if you watched it at the time, and she was they, they spent a, about two years where she was hooked on pills and in terrible. I time. remember that. I remember. I wasn't watching it, yeah. but I remember just keeping up with the story. And the men in her life were helpless. I suppose to say they were impotent. <laughs> on a prime time, it's never is never presented as kind of like powerless. Right. They, they, she, she was in control of her own life, so she was not. She would not get help when they wanted her to get help. So you got to see the femininity really of Victor. Mm-hmm. Victor became Victor became desperate and vulnerable and i think feminine power is i think femininity is so powerful you know because masculinity can be quite um kind of off-putting because it's very kind of like coarse and very um you know it's not very subtle whereas Mm -hmm. feminine energy is not only subtle (laughs) but it's kind of all-consuming and it kind of like takes you in to this state this higher state this is just my own theory totally be but i think it does take you to this higher state of awareness yeah deeper deeper sentiments about life yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. Were there, so it's a which of the American, so tell me, well, tell me this, because I actually, so I, I've never, I never really got into <clears throat> the British soaps, <clears throat> <clears throat> primarily because they really weren't, up until recently, they weren't really readily available here in yeah. the state. Um, you know, but I've kind of kept, you know, kind of known what's happened, and I actually, it's so funny, just, just really on like a, a drunken whim, I, um, I subscribe to BritBox, which is yeah. the um, the app, you know, the BBC, BBC and um, ITT, uh, ITV. Yeah. And, you know, all of the shows are on it. So I'm like, okay, I think I need to, especially since there's like no soaps left on the, in America, maybe I'm going to need to kind of get into this. What is it about uh, the British drama, the British daily serial um, that differs from the American, because you specifically said you were really drawn to yeah. um, to the American uh, 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 the, the American daytime dramas because of they're kind of set up with the mythical archetypes and and that's what drew you in. What what is it about the UK soaps that are that differ? I think that fundamentally the UK soaps are very naturalistic and they don't go for kind of. Um, even in terms of like classical Hollywood, it was kind of grand acting. It was grand emotion. Yeah, very big and over, very, over, very big, and, larger and than life. Larger than life, and sen there was sentiment, and there was a sense of romance, not just in kind of like love stories, but a sort sort of romantic way of looking at life, um, which I find is more kind of spiritual. Whereas the British soaps are very kind of like harsh and uh, no holds barred kind of. Um, they're very suspicious of emotion and I guess by saying that suspicious of kind of like anything kind of like feminine anything that's kind of um introspective anything introspective the British are very um wary of um, right very, I think that kind of stiff upper lip kind of yeah um, mentality where if you if you go on about your kind of emotional state of mind too much you're ridiculed. So there's a there's kind of like a um, a biting sense of humour in this country that doesn't have any time for kind of earnest. Yeah. Feeling. Well, it's a, it's a very reservedness. I mean, the, the, the it, British yeah. compared to Americans. I mean, Americans will tell you everything, like just culturally, like yeah. Americans spill the beans, and Americans will just more much more emotional. Well, it's true. I think in terms of the English upper classes, they're very reserved. But the working class in England um, have a lot of feeling. But I'd say, again, that um, it's kind of like uh, a lot of the English soaps are set in working class communities. But again, mm -hmm. the um, there isn't much room for kind of sentiment. Right. Or kind of um, if you kind of like have a grand a grandeur about something, it, it, people are suspicious of it. I mean, the only character in British soaps that I think really was larger than life and kind of glamorous was a character called uh, Bet Lynch in Coronation Street, who was, uh -huh. she dominated the show for years, she was very, she was very kind of, um, her emotions were like the women of American dramas. Yeah. And I do think that there was like a, that's why she dominated the show ultimately, it became about her kind of, her emotional landscape. So I think that fundamentally both of the, of the same in terms of the setup, but as, as you said, the, the, um, the sensibility towards life is so different. Yeah, it's and like you know, keep romance. calm and carry on versus live free or die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just love the kind of I just love the kind of the no holds barred melodrama sometimes. And I think that I think that some actors just kind of like shine when they get to be very transcendental, mm -hmm. and like. Um, very large, you know, like like all these film queens like Joan Crawford, Betty Davis. Yeah, it goes back to that. Yeah, um, well, when I think about that, the person like when I think about characters, and 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 particularly people, and, and they were played by, or, or maybe the, or I should say the actresses who um, really excelled in this particular medium because yeah. of that. I think of like um, she just passed away recently, Marge Dussain. Did you yeah. used to watch? Like I think she like excelled doing the oh. Alexander Spalding being so over the top, darling, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, Jeannie Cooper did that very, very well as yeah. well. Um, yeah, yeah. And everything they used, everything was about kind of um, presentation. 
And I remember I was watching about, you know, ballroom culture, uh, Paris is Burning documentary, and they referenced in that the soap operas when they were talking about stuff that they were inspired by. Mm-hmm. The, the, the women in the daytime soaps are very, it's about the kind of the look as mm-hmm. much as it's about the emotion. So, say, Mrs. Chancellor on Y&R, it was about, like, her nails were like talons. <laughs> you could see this, like, pose like that, you know, with the smoker's voice. And it was all very kind of grand and yeah. just, like, opulent. Yeah. It, Pete, in terms of the person, not in terms of, like, I don't just mean, like, in terms of they lived in, like, luxurious places. The, the, pe- the personality was luxurious. Yeah. And that is the quality which I think in British soaps is lacking. So it's 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 more American soaps you'd say are, are, are like more aspirational in their quality. Yeah, yeah. and I, I don't even necessarily see aspiration in terms of material things. I just think aspirational to a kind of large. Just be bigger, be bigger than bigger oneself. Than like yeah, the yearning, the yearning. Emo- that's the title of one of the soaps, Another World is about yearning for a different life, a diff- another way of living. Mm-hmm. So that I think that's the key ingredient, is that kind of yearning quality. And it goes across, because it's not just yearning for like a better life materially, but in terms of yearning for love, for acceptance, yeah. for understanding. And I think that those themes are really, the American dramas always were just hit right in the heart of, Totally. Speaking, you actually brought me back to another world because you posted yeah. a scene with Rachel Corey and Carl Hutchins. And I remembered yeah. it because that was around the time that I started watching that show. Because I remember yeah. when Carl Hutchins came back and I remember it was all ominous. Mm-hmm. He comes out of the thing. Remember, they always end it with like a big freeze frame. And, it was, and I remember I was like, who's this guy? And I, I remember that scene. And I was talking to a, a very good friend of mine uh, named Chris, who's also we've been we you know grew up together and we've yeah. always been so fans. And I I forgot how good of a show that was. Yeah. The the. the um, the um just the right the tone i feel like <clears throat> you know every show and uh you know kind of has its own feeling it has its own like it gets you in a specific zone yeah. and i just the zone of that show you were like almost like hypnotized and the back and forth was so it was dramatic but at the same time it was very um to the point yeah. um, and every, it was very poignant. And I, and I felt that they always had had such a really, I think they had a pretty consistent writing staff and I think that that helps, but they always had a way of, I think even if you didn't watch the show, if you just yeah. happen to catch a scene, you kind of intuitively knew what was going on and yeah. what the relationships were and, you know, what they were striving for. I, Oh, that was so sad when that show got canceled. That was such a good show. Yeah, it was, it was almost like the beginning of the end, wasn't it, for everything? Yeah. If that show was cancelled, like, all of them were then endangered species. Mm-hmm. I'm just... actually kind of worried now, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's, what, there's three shows left on, four shows left on American TV, you know, because, I mean, you know, they a lot of, they always pinpoint that when the soaps really had their decline was <clears throat> yeah. during the O.J. Simpson trial, because... Yeah. Soaps were, you know, um, uh, preempted for so long. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, again, watching a soap, part of a big part of it is just the habit of doing so. And when you fall out of the habit, then you yeah. just don't, you, know, you might go back. And I'm kind of worried that now, just with the world the way that it is now, every yeah. day I still watch my Bold and the Beautiful, even though they're like on the same scene they were in in 1997. But, <laughs> but like, what did you say? It's still Brooke, like, love line. Oh, my goodness. Well, like, it, let's talk about that. Like, literally, I happen to turn it on. I don't watch it daily anymore, but, like, just through the years now, I always kind of just check in and see how the old friends are doing. And Brooke did something and didn't tell Ridge, and so now Ridge is walking out, and it's, just like, it's, it's like the same <laughs> Same thing over and over again. You know, that show also, and I remember thinking about this when I was doing Our World, and I, I wrote a pilot for another show called World of Hope. This is years ago when I was doing the soap thing. And I I feel like that show is also 
speaking of the external and like, you know, how, um, you know, big budget and prime time and movies are all about the external, why soaps don't work in like a major city. Like you have to be in this small town because the only thing I ever think when I'm watching the show is, are these literally the only 10 people in yeah, Los yeah. Angeles? Like you can't find anybody else to date in Los Angeles. <laughs> So true. Uh, so you have to suspend your disbelief in that sense because so many characters would have just left. Like, say, the character of Phyllis on YNR, there's no mm -hmm. way she would have stayed in Genoa City for, what, 25 years? Yeah. No family there, no roots, you know. It's so unreal. It's kind of, I found that in the last 20 years, they've kind of free frozen, um, they put all the shows into kind of static and they just recycle the same storylines with the same. Yeah. What do you think that is? Do you think that's fear, like, of, of alienating? Because, like, yeah. at the end of the day, they're dying. They're, it's dying, period. Yeah. Like, at the end of dying. the day, 20, 30 years from now, there are not going to be any dramas on TV in, presented in that way. It just yeah. it is. So I wonder if, do you think it's kind of like a, okay... We're not really able to get any new people anymore. Young people aren't coming in during the summertime to watch the shows and getting hooked on the shows. So let's just kind of freeze it and like not alienate um, the folks um, who are currently watching, like just to kind of hold on to them. Yeah, exactly. You know, because there's only been a couple of times that I remember like where they tried to do something outside of the box, and that was when Loving became the city. Yeah. Which I think is fabulous. The fabulous. Loving good. was always. My, I'm sorry. It's very daring to do that. And it, and it was done well. Yeah. And then the other show, they tried it. They failed. Um, but I think it, it was ahead of its time was when they the last ditch effort to kind of resurrect Guiding Light. When they yeah. went to that kind of, they, they had like the show house and they did all the exteriors. Okay, we always they say that single... they tried to make it into kind of a British soap opera because the British soaps are all on exterior sets. They build... Like there's a soap we have called EastEnders where mm -hmm. they built like the whole square outside with the pub and uh -huh. the action is on this on this kind of outdoor set. So I think Guiding Light tried to do that with the but they, in a way they were just trying to cut corners, weren't they, with the budget? Well, and well, that was absolutely. I mean, I think that was like the big thing, right? I think that they were just trying to. They had no budget, and they're like, okay, let's do it. And, and the thing is, it came it came across as cutting corners because it was like a really really. It, the production quality was bad, but at the same time, I also think that um, it was a bit ahead of its time. So, yeah. I mean, aside from the fact you had the stupid wobbly cameras and all of that jazz, I yeah. think that just, you know, there were like even like primetime shows weren't necessarily filming that way. Yeah. And five or six years later, after the show got canceled, that kind of more rugged style kind of came in vogue. So I kind of think that it was a little bit ahead of its time. Again, soap operas leading the way. <laughs> but maybe maybe things go in cycles because I'm hoping that there'll be a return to that kind of um, studio base kind of um, lighting with background music. And yeah. Emotional, emotional storytelling. I know that we live in an era now where kind of sentiment is not in vogue, you know, everything has to be kind of ironic and mm -hmm. cool and um, anything that's kind of earnest is a little bit kind of sneered at. Yeah. I'm hoping that this, this uh, what we're going through now, this pandemic, people kind of um, want to see... Slow it, down a little bit. And they want to see yearning stories again and they want to see things about love instead of money. Yeah. So they yeah. want things about kind of because aspirations just part of human life. We all have that, but I, I think I still think there's there's things in life which are quite kind of pure mm -hmm. and losing that. And it's nice to see it, you know, kind of um, first love. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, I don't uh, know. It'll, it'll be interesting. I mean, I think it's two things, right? Like, I think that we mm -hmm. now gotten to a place where i mean like if you look at like a gen gen z you know it's all most of them don't even watch like television as we know it it's all about yeah. short term short form content with authentic personalities who yeah. are just either spilling their guts or you know whatever it is like and 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 
And then separately, I think just the way that the world um, evolved with technology and being so global and, and, you know, we have to do 18 things at once to keep everything going. Just there wasn't time to sit through a soap opera, right? Yeah. Um, it will be interesting since the world shut down and everyone has kind of been forced to kind of reevaluate their value system, right? And what really matters versus what doesn't. Yeah. It will be interesting as everything reopens because it's gonna be a very slow, long process, how quickly we kind of go back to, where's my Blackberry? To, yeah. or, or if, we ever, if we do go back in that same way. Um, so I think there, there could possibly be a way, but I just don't know that um, telling a story over five hours a week I don't okay. think, I think that we've just, in terms of our attention span culturally, I just feel like we've kind of evolved past that, you know? That's totally true. There's no attention span anymore, and it's nobody's fault because it's just the way we've been conditioned. Because as we've had more channels, and then with the internet exposure and social media, we can we can can't, um, do so many things at once, you know? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Whereas in like the 1970s, a scene on a soap opera would go on for about eight minutes nonstop. Mm -hmm. And I think you'd get so much from the actor, like you had Mac and Rachel having a fight, you know. Yeah. It, 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 it would build up. I mean, I wasn't born then. I was born but, but there wasn't that like, like okay, we're going to do a two minute scene and then we'll cut and then we'll cut back and we'll cut back and then we'll cut back. No, I not recognize that. Like, so when I, when I was studying yeah. um, soap writing, um, there was this, a channel, I don't know if, if they rolled it out in the UK, there was a channel that uh, ABC owned called SoapNet. We didn't have a, we didn't have any of the American soaps. I only, I only kind of um, discovered them. My initiation was we really had the bold and the beautiful ones. And, but once we got um, internet access, you know, I, I was introduced to them through kind of like reading synopses and stuff. Right. Then, like with the advent of YouTube, I've really been able to kind of educate myself on all the histories, of the different, and the actors that really drew me in. But anyway, going back to what you were saying, sorry. Yeah. Saying. Well, one of the one of the things that they aired every single day, they aired um, Ryan's Hope. Yeah. And I would watch. Have you ever seen any episodes of Ryan's Hope? Yeah, I've watched a few of that. Well, I was hooked because they had like literally they would start and like I think over like a multi year period they. They did. I think they would show two episodes a day, but they started from the, the pilot episode. Yeah. And then I think that they would go up to like 1981. Mm -hmm. But then like after this point, I think there was some licensing issues. So then they'd start back at the pilot. So I was, you know, watching this show in real time as though it were, you know, 1977. And I was just so amazed that like literally, you know, it's a 30 minute show it was a half hour show. But there literally would maybe be two scenes. Mm -hmm. And like the first act is just one scene that's like a conversation between like Maeve Ryan and one of her kids. And it's yeah. it's a play. It's like just a stage that's play. And it's, and it's just, and you just get sucked in. And, but, and it's so sad that we don't have that attention span because like you said, it really, it's like a slow build and then it just crescendos. And then you're just like, okay, I got to tune in tomorrow. <laughs> Well, it's like the best um, kind of, I suppose it's like the best um, sex, really, isn't it? It's just mm -hmm. uh, low, you know, and it, there's, a, there's foreplay. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. But going back to what you said, that, that key word, I think, is theatre. And I think the soaps were, I do consider them to be theatre. They were, they were, at one point, they were live. Mm -hmm. They were like live plays. And I think the thing about theatre, which is so different from film, is it's completely kind of immediate. Um, and so it's kind of what you get is you get something that's, that's completely spontaneous and kind of yeah. in the actor's response. And I, that, I love the kind of um, everyone always sneers, oh, it looks like a soap opera. It looks like a soap opera because of the way the image looks. Mm -hmm. The image, I, I think someone like Tyler Perry has retained this. It looks like a stage play. You know, mm -hmm. it, looks like it's, uh, it looks like it's actually happening in front of you. Whereas yeah. The film, the film quality takes you to a more kind of remote, a more aloof environment. Mm -hmm. Not as kind of, um, it's not as powerful for me. Yeah. So, well, obviously film has its power and its advantages. 
but I just think like when you strip down to that kind of basic stagecraft, with actors actors become the forefront. Because that's what they do. That's 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 yeah. what you're going. Because the thing is, right, you know, you always say film is a director's medium, right? Yeah. It's all about the director. Television, primetime television is is the writer's medium, right? It's yeah. all, they, they call the shots. But in live theater, it's really the actor's medium actors. because the writer can do all they want and the director can tell them. But, like, once the curtain's up, the actors have that's free it. reign to, <laughs> to do whatever and they want. Why, exactly. And that's why I think um, daytime drama is the actor's medium as well because however... Uh, However ridiculous a storyline was, say the uh, Reva Shane clone storyline, <laughs> because, because an actress like Kim Zimmer is so authentic in everything she does, and she's so kind of relatable and believable and moving, she mm-hmm. sold it, and you completely believed it. And it's a ridiculous story, it's a ridiculous premise, but if the actor is kind of that authentic mm-hmm. and soulful, I think they can do it, they're so the yeah, actor can do anything, really. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of ridiculous storylines, do you have a storyline aside from that one that you kind of think about as like, what were they smoking in that writer's room when they pitched this idea? I think the um, the one that really gets to me is Crystal Chappelle as Carly Manning being buried alive. Oh, like, and then they have like a, like a speaker in there for yeah. a tonic. <laughs> doing an element for the speaker in to accentuate Carly's torture, uh, and it even gave her ox- she had an oxygen tank in there or something. She had, had <laughs> Days like- of Our Lives got pretty crazy. I never was Days wasn't a show that I watched, yeah. but I rem- I just you know again like I was a big soap, so I'd always read my soap days, so I always knew what was going on. Didn't like um didn't Marlena become like the devil or something, or wasn't she like possessed yeah. by a demon or something? But, but the thing is that storyline is so. It goes back to what I was saying about mythical. Yeah. Obviously mythical. But it was interesting because Stefano visited her at night in the months leading up to that. And it was called the Queen of the Night storyline. And he took her into this kind of dream world. And we never knew if it was a real or if it was her dreaming. And it was almost like the devil tempting Christ with the, um, the you know, the glory of the world, you know. Uh-huh. So it had this real biblical, mythical power to it. And you got the sense that um, it was like a decadent environment that she was being tempted with. And that is the cause of her possession. So it was almost like an allegory. It was like yeah. a metaphor for, it was a metaphor for kind of like a decadent world. Once you kind of get too hedonistic, you become, you become ill and you mm-hmm. waste away. And I think her being possessed was her, she was wasted away from kind of Stefano's influence. So it was it was totally realistic in a kind of psychological sense. Yeah. Even the story was like a fairy tale. It was authentic in a completely different way. Totally. Um, and I think I think there was something about that storyline in the buried alive one. They played it very straight. They didn't play it self consciously camp. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem is when you play it self consciously for laughs. It's no longer like um, as campy. It's no longer as flam- or, uh, opulent. Right. What they they Deidre Hall never betrayed any emotional beat in that storyline. She played it completely straight. Mm-hmm. So it becomes much more kind of um, potent, I think, because of that. Yeah. Whereas it's just been silly. It, we would not be talking about it today. Well, so does that mean you weren't a fan of um, Passions? Because Passions became like like yeah, this over the top. It was a huge thing, but I that personally isn't to my taste because I feel like I feel like the actors were too kind of self aware of the stupidity of the storylines, mm-hmm. and it kind of ruined it for me. I like it when the actors kind of play it straight, even though it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. They are um, there's a scene on Guiding Light where Reva um, and it was Kim Zimmer's Emmy submission. And she says to Josh something like, um, this woman has no identity because there's only one Reba Shane in this world and she's standing right here in front of you. That's <laughs> 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 so ridiculous, but she said completely straight. Yeah. That is the key. You have to play it straight. And it, the queerness or whatever, or the camp will be self-evident after it, you know, with the finished product. Totally. You're, yeah, I think you're. I think you might be scraping your microphone because that's. I don't. 
you got it? I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I just, I just hear you scraping your microphone, so I don't want, I don't want anyone to miss anything that you're saying. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. No worries. Go for um, it. Yeah, so I just, I love those kind of, I love it when they, uh, kind of the, the, uh, the nerve to play something ridiculous, but play it in a way that's sincere. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that that's a, and I think in a way maybe it's because they they began in the theatre or something, so they're not they're not afraid of anything that the writer can throw at them. So there's a trait they can always fall back on something that's very authentic and very kind of um, believable because they've been trained to do that. Whereas I think actors that probably don't get the training in this kind of theatre, they could um, be a bit cast adrift. Yeah. When, to kind of like more ambitious work, you know. Totally. No, yeah. totally. So but I'm trying to think of where who else was ever like really over the top. Santa Barbara was kind of an over the top show. I mean, they were a little comical in how they. Yeah. They had, a, I think they had a really wry sense of humor, kind of British sense of humor in a way. But kind of, because um, I remember Mace and Capwell played by Lane Davis. He walks in on Robin Matson being slapped and slapping uh, Justin Dees, I think it is. And he says something like, oh, it's another evening of parlor games by the Marquis de Sade. And that's, <laughs> you know, a, a, um, that's the line that only kind of, you know, that kind of sophisticated, like, in gag. I yeah. Love yeah, because it's a little farcical. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. That's so funny. Well, do you have, like, what was your, what, like, what will go down as your all-time, like, where you said, you know, this is as far as, it could be a story arc, or it could be a moment where you're just like, yes, this is the pinnacle of what this medium, this is this medium excelling to the highest oh. that it can ever excel. Oh, I have, to be honest, I have dozens <laughs> off the top of my head. Um, I really liked... I know this is in terms of um, this is kind of out, outlandish, but I liked Reaver's return storyline from the dead because I felt that um, it was very ambitious to kind of like have her be a ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, but they later clarified that it was she was like an astral projection of herself from a coma. So the mm -hmm. ghost really was she. It was her willpower from the coma kind of channeling her soul back into Springfield. And I just yeah. thought that so, there was something so kind of poignant about the premise of um, of a dead woman or a seemingly dead woman um, appearing to the people that had lost her, it, you know, as a ghost, but dropping kind of signs of her, of her existence. Yeah. And trying to kind of check that Annie was going to be a good wife to Josh. And look after her children um and then when reva wakes up from the coma and becomes like an amish woman uh -huh. it's just the storyline even though it's completely implausible it was just um you really got to go on the journey with her from kind of like reclaiming from that kind of like a, that primal situation to reclaiming her life it's totally and I and I think it and I think what's so great about it also, you know, in hindsight, is that it really, it's really true to and aligns to the roots of that show, right? Because yeah. it was originally about this pastor and being this kind of like spiritual guider to to this entire community. So I think it it, it, it even though it sounds like an outlandish storyline, it's very very true to the soul of the show yeah. and the DNA of the show. Absolutely. Because it's the it's the journey back to um, she lost her life and you know my thesis was on this kind of idea of the liminal that kind mm -hmm. of in state where you you've lost your identity and you're on the verge of finding a new one but it's the it's the process it's called I suppose, I suppose um all the mythologists would call it the hero's journey where you have to go through ordeals to reclaim your birthright or reclaim your identity. And I think the storyline where Reva kind of reclaims her life, it touches on that. And yeah, you... absolutely. I'm hearing a little interference on your mic. Oh, sorry. No I'm worries. Like... Um, and other storylines that I really, I really like the Karen Wolek storyline where she lived the double life. 
The which storyline? Um, the Karen and Rolex storyline on One Life to Live. Oh yeah! Oh, that was in that was like the <laughs> Judas Light. It culminated with Judas Light's big courtroom <laughs> scene. Yeah. And it culminates in the 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 kind of the double, the double. And what's interesting about that to me is that um, it utilizes the uh, domestic sphere of the traditional soap opera. You know, the woman within the home, mm-hmm. but the I the life that's being lived in secret beyond the home, that kind of otherness. Yeah. And if that kind of danger, that's something that's looming on the outside that's going to destroy the the perfect world within. Because she played that so well, that kind of that, that precarious balance of, you know, the two the two sides. Um but uh I really like the storyline with um the Sheila crossover. And oh my again, goodness, that was yeah. that. Can I tell you, I think that that. So I've always watched Bold and the Beautiful. I never really watched Young and the Restless, but I had family, like, so I, but I always knew what was going on on Young and the Restless, but I never, yeah. like, recorded it. But that Sheila crossover storyline, I remember that's when I started watching Young and the Restless with that whole Sheila thing. And then they brought her over to Los Angeles. Oh my God, that is probably. That actually might be my favorite storyline in like the history of soap. Yeah, was so good. Must see TV. Oh my god! And then the other thing that I remember as being like the pinnacle of soap telling. You you watch the Bold and the Beautiful. You've seen the Bold. Yeah. Another person who is so larger than life, who's so amazing. I think you posted about her recently. Sally Spectra. Yeah. I don't know if you ever saw the series of episodes. When she realized, remember, she was married to Clark Garrison, right? She's this big older woman, and he's like this kind of suave playboy. And they find yeah. out that he's really marrying her and staying married to her up until a certain point. Because after, I like, think, a certain point, a uh, certain date, the way that the prenuptial agreement is set up, he gets like half of her money. And she realized yeah. it. And so they, up until like the final moment, her. And Saul, rest his soul, yeah. and Darla, like, plot to kick Clark out. I remember that being one of the most thrilling roller coaster rides in the world. And it was so fun. Again, it was so over the top. It was... <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, they were like her band of misfits, weren't they? Yeah. So, oh, and he was so trying fun. to con her and, and take, you know, he was going to uh, make her son illegitimate or whatever. So, yeah. I don't, I don't want your son to have my name. So, again, it's that kind of thing that goes back to like the woman's picture in Hollywood. It's the women, the women kind of coming into their own. Yeah. The, the genre for it, you know. Definitely. Oh, so good. I wonder, I need to see if, if that, if that, because I, I love how some fans, you know, I, one of the things I do love about YouTube, even though, you know, content theft is a thing. Yeah. I love how, like, you know, the super fans will, you know, t- will will put together. For example, kind of like the um, the last storyline on all, um, as the world turns with um, what's his name, Luke and um, Noah. Yeah. You know, like someone's like put together the entire romance from start to finish really? of just this scene, and you can just relive like an entire story arc. Oh God, I wonder if I someone's that. done that for that for that Clark and Sally because that was so wonderful. Oh, I miss that character so much. She was brilliant. She was she had what um, you know, not only did she have that Kim sensibility, but it's what I was saying about Kim Zimmer that kind of like earthy, you know, the Earth Mother kind of really believable, really kind of like real. Yeah, yeah. You just want to be you bask in their glow. Yeah. I love it. I do hate, speaking of characters, I really do hate, and I guess I get why they did it, because the character's so larger than life that it's wonderful. I really do hate, though, that when Darlene Connolly died, that they didn't give the character, like, a proper send-off, you know, because it was was so many moments. But at the same time, I do think the way that they sent her off, she's living on the Canary Islands with, like, 20 houseboys or something. Yes. (laughs) But that was... But you're right, she didn't get a creepy, like when Jean Cooper died, they, did, they had like episodes where all the old actors came back and discussed her off camera. Mm-hmm. And I think that Darlene Conley definitely deserved that kind of tribute as well. Um, because those are the actors that we really remember. They're totally. like, and Paul characters, 
Um, I'm still hearing, I'm sorry to interrupt you, I'm still hearing the scraping. I just, I'm sorry, so hang on, let me move back, because um, I'll move back to where I was kissing before. Okay, cool. I don't know what that was. That was, like, really strange. Yeah. Well, listen, listen, I want to keep this conversation going, but unfortunately, for the folks who are listening on Hot 702, it is time to say goodbye to Dr. Adam Ghani. Thank you so much for joining us on the radio show. But um, and thank you all for listening. Um, and we're going to actually keep this conversation going. So tomorrow you'll be able to find it on the podcast, Showtime with uh, 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 Jordan Van Haslow. I forgot my own name. Showtime, Showtime thank with you Jordan so Van Haslow. Thank you for having me. I really, it was thrilling to be here. Absolutely. Thank you all for listening and stay tuned for uh, Martini Mondays on Hot 702.5 FM Vegas. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> on with the show. So, um, yeah, so they didn't give her, what were we talking about? Because we were talking about Darlene Conley. They didn't yeah. really give her a big, you know, and I, and I, and and again, like I just hate that because she was such a great character, and and, and Darlene Connolly was like, I really feel like she found her niche as an actress, and it was so wonderful. But at the same time, having her go off to live in the Canary Islands with a bunch of young men is it's a very Sally Spectra thing Sally to do. Fancy, isn't it for sure? Um, you know, and that that was so, and also her, her interaction with Stephanie Forrester, oh, which is great. Go back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> You had kind of Susan Flannery as the kind of like austere, very kind of a moral, uppity matriarch. Mm-hmm. And Darling Conley was total antithesis mm-hmm. to this wonderful um, tennis match. Yeah, well, what what was great about it that I think, say, would be was missing between the animosity between Stephanie and Brooke, right? Or... Um, on on um, Young and the Restless, the animosity between Kay Chancellor and um, uh, yeah. Jill um, is the fact that at the end of the day, Kay is older and the grand dame, right? And Sally or Stephanie is older than Brooke and the grand dame, so it just she's coming from a place of power that this person doesn't have. Mm-hmm. Whereas what made the Stephanie uh, uh, Sally rivalry is so good is that okay even though Stephanie is, has the older money or whatever it is they're like equals so mm-hmm. you're, it's not like this person up here and this person up here like you know fighting it's like these are two broads who are like on the same toe you know on yeah. the same place and like really want the same thing but because of their life circumstances are coming at it in a totally different way that yeah. neither of us can understand. And so it, that's what I think it's thrilling when you see like this, this, uh, this fight amongst equals. Yes. Oh, you know, exactly. Yeah. And yeah. And they both have that gravitas in their own ways, that kind of that real depth of character. And you know, when an actor is a bit kind of, um, green. Yeah. And that's why I think an actor like say, um, if you watch how Cynthia Watrous evolved on Guiding Light, uh-huh. at the beginning, um, she was she was good, but she only became like really remarkable once Kim Zimmer was like her her frequent co star. Mm-hmm. And Cynthia found the character and she just became well, I actually think she was kind of like borderline genius. When Annie was kind of losing the plot. Mm-hmm. And, fall from grace on the witness stand and then becoming like the pariah of Springfield. And Cynthia was very, not only was she kind of um, completely larger than life, but she was very poignant. Mm -hmm. I think it was working with Kim, which um, was her kind of acting school, really. Mm -hmm. And she's a brilliant actress. So I love that. It's what you were saying about the, the, um, the tennis match of equals, you know, on, mm-hmm. on a stage. It's so exciting. That's why we watch. It's that, yeah. it, 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 it goes back to what I was saying about archetypes. It's the different, it's the different archetypal energies kind of uh, combining, you know. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm just... there's, so, there's so many storylines. I don't even have a top 10. I, I love... Um, Natalie on All My Children and her evolution. She came in the show as a kind of um, Erica's love rival, but she became she became this kind of um, romantic heroine. And I mm. loved her emotional kind of arc on the show. 
And I think yeah. Kate Collins is so underrated as an actress. I, just, I think yeah. she's my favourite. Um, she's my absolute favourite. And then I loved Anne Heche on Another World, the twins, because she gave them completely different mannerisms. And this yeah. girl is 19 years old. So I started watching that show. So I, I started watching um, soaps, I would say like 1991-ish. Yeah. So Anne Heche, so when I watched it, Jensen Buchanan was yeah. playing it. I don't, I'm not as familiar was with, um, with Anne Heche's run on the show. Um, but I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, I think Anne Heche started in 87, late 87. She was on until 91. Right, and that's and that's about the time I probably started watching it like right after she left the show. Yeah. yeah. Oh and in God. a way, in a way, I feel that I mean, I, w- I wouldn't say this for Julianne Moore, but I think with Anne Heche, it's like she's never had a character that has been as deep or characters as mm-hmm. deep as the ones she played on that show. And I feel that actors, I feel that if you get a role of a lifetime on a soap, you're just so lucky. You can mm-hmm. play everything. You can play everything, and if you're a fan favorite, you can work for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. I remember watching an interview with um, Joan Collins, and she was talking about how, like, season two or season three of the show, I forget who the person was, the character was, but they decided to leave. I guess they just kind of thought, like, okay, I'm on a hot show now. Okay. Now's my... Yeah. Now is my chance, you know, to become a movie star or whatever. And I just remember she was like, dude, that's like the opposite of like rats running off of a sinking ship. Yeah. It's like, dude, this, is, this yeah. is probably as good as it's going to get. So we need to milk it and enjoy it and revel in it. <laughs> yeah, because Mom- Joan, had, Joan got Dynasty. I think we call it Dynasty in England. We pronounce uh-huh. it. She got it when she was, I think, 50. Yeah. So she'd been, she paid her dues as, as mm-hmm. an actor, you know. So she knew that this was like the pinnacle. And and I guess Pamela Sue Martin kind of was thinking of, you know, I can go on to films or whatever. But Joan was probably speaking from her own experience about what a kind of unique situation. This, this, yeah. this show that's like the biggest show, like, again, like that kind of a thing happens. I mean, like, if you, if you look at like, you know, that's a, you, like, think about it like a show like Friends, right? Mm-hmm. They've all gone on to great careers and, and such. No, no one, they will never have that kind of success in television yeah. ever again. Like, you can't repeat that. It's the equivalent of winning the lottery or getting struck by lightning. So, yeah. you know, again, revel in it and you milk it for as long as you can. Yeah. My favorite show, and it always gets, it was always like the little engine that could, and it always gets you know, really bad rep because they did like always have like every two years they had a new writing team and I guess it was schizophrenic, but it was the first soap I ever remember like watching. And like yeah. I was like a little kid and I just, I think it was I, the, the opening of the show, you know, like really, you know, the, the opening, the graphics of the opening, I remember it was probably like seven, six yeah. or seven, I guess drew me in. And so I started watching and I'm sure most of it like went way over my head, but then as I got older and like in like 91 really started um, coming back and like was I was like I kind of wonder how I got through junior high school because then I look back I was taping and watching like three and a half or four hours of soaps a night. Yeah well I actually have a I think that the characters on a because it's like um because it's naturalistic in the sense that it's every day I um I think that um the characters are like become substitutes to people in our own lives. And I think that, um, sorry, my phone's going. Can I come back to you in a second? Yeah, go for it. Stop, stop. Hang on. Uh, what was I going to say? I think that characters become substitutes for people in our own lives. So say if you've not got a good relationship with your parents, mm-hmm. you can watch, say, um, Bob and Kim on As the World Turns, and they're so kind of, they're the couple, they're the parents. They're everyone. stable, they're level-headed, stable. They, they're caring. They're so overly concerned about their children. And I think that they become your surrogate parents. I really do. So yeah. I think I think the, the characters on soaps were like the friends that we might not have had or the friends we wish we had. Totally. Or the totally. Very- no, definitely. Or the friends we wish we had. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, my favorite show, like I said, it was a little show that could, and it always got like bad rap. It was always the last in the ratings. And yeah, the writing could be uneven because like every 
two years, there would be a total turnover in the writing staff. But again, I loved this show and I watched the show for such a long time up until the end was loving. Yeah. Loving was my favorite soap. And I remember really, really getting into it. Um, I guess it worked in terms of getting kids in during summer it was like 1991 when um, uh, Laura Sisk and um, yeah. oh God, what's his name? He's on NCIS now. Um, Michael Weatherly and, uh, uh, the Noxzema girl, uh, Rebecca Gayhart, when they had yeah. that whole frat, they were all like in college and, oh my God, I just remember so well. Again, show gets like no prompts whatsoever. No one ever watched the show, but the loving murders, the way that they ended that show was yeah. one of the greatest arcs in soap history. And Christine Tudor Newman's Amazing. monologue and the heartache and the, oh my God, it was like that, to me, that is probably one of the That's greatest. The yeah. mm -hmm. And I, and I, oh. <laughs> no, no, that was so powerful. That was like Greek drama. That was like watching Medea on stage, you know. Uh huh. Like the, the mother that killed her children. And she's holding the syringe, isn't she, to her head. And she's, <laughs> and you don't, she's gonna stab herself. And she's like, I didn't. I was trying to release them from their pain, you know, and she's really, like, in hysteria. And it's just that, I just, my God. In a way, they let the actor kind of um, really go for it, don't they? Mm -hmm. And that's what soap can do. A soap's not, a, a soap's not kind of trying to contain the, the uh, narrative. It lets, you, um, it lets it unfold. Yeah, totally, totally. Oh, God, I still get, again, someone probably has that all out because that was so good and you know, what's, you know what's interesting to me um you know when everyone says like what's the greatest tv show of all time people say stuff like um the wire or like um some prime time show but i don't remember in those shows like these great emotional arcs you know like say with the loving murders where you had her meltdown at the end it i think and so i think that a lot of the performances um that are great have been overlooked simply because they're emotional. Mm -hmm. People people look down on that kind of excessive emotion or sentiment, you know. But I think also, like you said before, you can't quantify it because yeah. to really get to really understand, like that scene, to understand that scene, you had to have seen not only just the arc of that storyline, but you had to understand the history of like her relationship with. Uh, Trisha and her son and Clay and you know what I mean like to to really understand yeah, you know like, like, you want like, you you have to have like it's an amalgamation versus mm -hmm. a prime time show if you've been watching for you know if you watch 13 episodes it's like oh I get it yeah you know whereas you know that moment that that was 13 years of a story build up I, to that yeah. moment you know <laughs> and it, came, it was like on One Life to Live where I think it was a retcon when Dorian revealed that Vicky's father had sexually molested her as a child uh -huh. and that was the reason she had split personalities because she blocked it out uh -huh. and it was the history of the, I think the show was about 30 years old by then it was 30 years of history coming in, in like one episode coming to the ball with these two women like faced off uh huh. And Victoria couldn't cope, and she becomes she splits off into a new personality because she can't cope with the truth, you know. And Dorian yeah. raging at her, going, "Your father was a immoral tyrant." <laughs> and Robin Strasser was so good, and she's like, <laughs> "Oh my god!" I, I, yeah, I wish there was um um, I don't know. I miss like a soap nut. I wish there was a a way I would love to I was talking to my friend Chris like I said when you when you posted that Rachel Corey show yeah. um uh to um uh to uh about just we're just talking to him about it. I was like oh my goodness I would love because you know I, I don't know if you remember right when um when Procter and Gamble was getting out of the soap business mm -hmm. they changed their name so so, so to like Telenex so <laughs> I'm assuming so that like none of the people who they wanted to sell Pampers to would be pissed and try to boycott. Um, but for a while, they had like about a year or two's worth of episodes of Another World on YouTube. I imagine they took them down just from 
it probably was, you know, yeah. just the life, just the business and legal affairs alone was probably not worth the return. But I wish that there was like a place where you could just like watch, yeah, just watch and say like, you know what, I want to relive. Like again, I I think of like that ninety one to ninety three or four period is like the pinnacle of my like soap fandom. I would love, I would dedicate another three years of my life to relive that whole mo- yeah. that that whole period. You know, just before just before OJ, right? It was. It was like the um, that was the final golden age, wasn't it? Where you had real. It was like it was almost like reading a novel. The soaps then it was like a literary. The characters were like literary characters. Yeah. It was rich and textured, and um, it was just it was just superlative, really. The kind of the range, and the kind of intelligence. You know, they didn't. And I think once once the ratings started plummeting, I think they stopped making an effort. Yeah. Well, they start. They said, well, they they lost money. I yeah. think I think it's a couple things. Stop making an effort, but the budgets are cut, right? Like if you think about like especially like Days of Our Lives. I think Days of Our Lives is like six months ahead of like Days of Our Lives will still totally air throughout this whole thing. Yeah. But they were on such a. I think that they did. They recorded something like an episode and a half a day. Yeah. Something along those lines. Right. And it's like, you just can't, it's not even about an effort, but it's, you just can't. Like if I have to, if you basically write a week, a week's worth of a show like that is basically two feature films. Yeah. And so if you're like, we need to produce, in, <laughs> every week we need to produce two and a half feature films. Yeah. You know, like there, there isn't even, you, there really isn't, there isn't time for effort. It's just, we just need to get it on the page, yeah. get it going, film it, go. Get it's it on the page, get it going. Like- you know, but you know, it's so funny. We're, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. Go for it. I was about to say, I'd, ra- I'd rather have no shows left at all than them kind of continuing in the state they are and in the state yeah. the day. But I think it. T- this, if people watch, during this pandemic watch the shows now, I think that they kind of confirm all the stigmas that they have. Oh about. right, like see, I told you this is stupid. Yeah, I told you uh-huh. this is it's yeah. slow. It's unrealistic. Cool. It's mm-hmm. and and that's what they think they've always been like, and they haven't. That's yeah. We. This is why I use my page for this because I think we have to showcase the glory days, you know, because I want people to see these performers that I'm worried people are going to be forgotten about, you know. Yeah. Like Elizabeth, yeah. as Lucinda Walsh, you know. Oh, she was so she wonderful. Was, Another grand, larger than life bar. Uh, can we not forget freaking Lisa Hughes? Oh, Eileen. <laughs> And she's just like that in real life. I saw her do a cabaret show in New York one year, and she's just as, like, feisty and over. And the woman was, like, damn near 80 at the time, you know? (laughs) Incredible. She was, and she was really, like, the first major icon of the genre. Mm -hmm. And kind of, I guess people just think Susan Lucci or Deidre Hall. Right. Was the one that was the the very beginning. Um, Yeah. In terms of glamour, I guess. The glamorous film yeah. fatale, the, yeah. the oh. kind of like woman you, uh, anti-hero a little bit. Yeah, yeah. totally. It's that kind of like the re- the dark side of all of us that kind of is not not the, as you say, that kind of bad girl, but humanized. Mm-hmm. It's very... Because, because even if she did some messed up things, you, you had empathy for it. It's like, okay, you know, if I were that person in those circumstances, having had that background... I can understand why I might make that choice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Those, Speaking of choice, I'm sorry, go for it. I was actually, those are the characters that are really the meat and potatoes of the genre. Yeah. They, they, they provide decades worth of storyline. Um, and interesting, like Rachel Corey, you know, she was like really hard at the beginning mm-hmm. and, and kind of devilish. But by the end, she'd gone through so much that you could you could believe that she'd become a moral person mm-hmm. been through so much turmoil yeah and uh, oh by the way i want to say this earlier um somebody like carl hutchins charles keating you'd never see a character like that on a british soap opera because he's he's shakespearean he's he's very grand mm-hmm. and you just never see it so i just think that's <laughs> in- that's interesting he was a good character there have been some great male him um yeah. Roger Thorpe. Roger Thorpe. Brilliant. Oh my God, Roger Thorpe was. I remember when he died. Oh, that was so. Yeah. Oh, him and um, what was her name? Corey Jenna Mar- Bradshaw, the jewel thief. Uh, 
Yeah, Jenny Bradshaw, brilliant. Yeah, they really, I love that. I wanted to become um, a jewel thief after watching her. I was like, that would be such a wonderful career move. She is brilliant. Um, the actress who played Jenny Bradshaw, I also loved her on One Life to Live as Gabrielle. Uh-huh. Gabrielle and Tina were the kind of d- dynamic duo. Uh, kind of like, I, I remember once I called them Cinderella and Rapunzel on Acid. <laughs> Gabrielle had the long hair, and um, Tina was like this kind of Cinderella, and they were just like this great kind of going back to what we were saying about archetypes kind of very very kind of like mythical colorful characters yeah but she was great Fiona Hutchison is very underrated mm-hmm. is she uh, still working I read that she was a drama coach at a school in okay. New York or something okay. um yeah. but yeah what other male characters do you um, really like I, I, in the, what your favorite male well, like I said, I think Roger Thorpe is probably, like, hands down one of the greatest in the world. Um, Adam, All My Children, yeah. is another yeah. great male character that they really let uh, be juicy. Um, on my favorite show, even though, again, yes, every two years there was a different actor playing the character and a different writer's team, but Clay Alden yeah. was, a, was a real son of a bitch. Um, um, I'm trying to think, who else? Are there, I, I, I know I'm forgetting somebody who is... Who is like just the grand Victor Newman, of course. Um, oh, but Roger Thorpe, man. And um, now I want to go watch Dick. some old Guiding Light. Yeah, <laughs> I love Dan Slow. I think he's so committed to the role, you know. And the great thing about him and someone like Anthony Geary on General Hospital, they didn't want to make them likable, mm-hmm. and they wanted to kind of keep them as bastards. And because they knew there was such there was such potent kind of uh, storyline there, yeah, and they kind of yeah, they were authentic to their characters all the way through. And, if, and I think the problem with um, a character like Reva, they tried to make her like the lovely mo- mother, and it was it kind of betrayed the edgier the edgier the 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 slut of Springfield, yeah. I know totally. Emma was frustrated about that. Because they said when Cynthia Watrous was playing Annie, Reva was very much the heroine. And mm-hmm. Kim Zimmer didn't want to play normal. She wanted to be that kind of... And I think the clone storyline allowed her to get back in touch with that ridiculous... Yeah. Um, yeah. But what you were saying about Adam Chalmer... Sorry if I'm going back and forth. No, things. go for it. Go for um, it. There was an episode of Oprah where she had the cast of All My Children... And Susan Lucy she says, this is about 1990, Susan Lucy says, um, the difference between daytime and prime time is on prime time a man will be involved in a chase scene. Mm-hmm. And you never get to know the man, but in a daytime drama, you get the man's emotional life kind of mm-hmm. being chased. So she spelled it out, really. Yeah. And so, so David Canary probably did his best work in daytime television as a result. Oh, totally. And then he got to play the the brother. That that was. Yeah. A, oh my God! When the brother's wife died, that was a very moving storyline too. Cindy yeah. was that her name? Yeah. She died of AIDS. That was. I remember that. Oh, God, dude, I could talk about soaps all day. Yeah. <laughs> they, the the characters that always had AIDS were always women, weren't they? They could never mm-hmm. be male. They could, and much less a gay male. They could totally. never be a man with AIDS on the soap. That's, that's actually worry. really interesting. I didn't think about that, but you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely right. One was up on YNR. It was Cricket's mother that married John Abbott. And then it was in the 90s. It was Keisha, who was the other woman who was um, having an affair with Olivia's husband. Mm-hmm. And uh, Drusilla used to go and visit her and call her all these names. <laughs> Shout out to Victoria Rao because she's also one of my favorites. Yeah, um, I think she's so a character out in real life as well. Yeah, so she's so I've heard. <laughs> she just, she's just somebody that you just, um, whenever she's on screen, she's going to be doing something interesting. Yeah, very Great. much so. And I love that she was also doing prime time at the same time. She oh, that's right. She was on about Diagnosis Murder. Yeah. yeah. So she must have been the hardest working actress in the business. No, I think that that was um, Tamara Tooney. Oh, yeah, Tamara. Tamara Tooney was doing Law and Order. She was doing. Wow. She, while she was doing, she was doing Law and Order and she was doing As the World Turns. 
Oh, I guess she was only doing two. No, the hardest working woman in the business is Kelly Ripa. Yeah. When Kelly, listen to me. When Kelly Ripa, see, you, and you, I don't think you'd remember this because it was you know all American TV. But when Kelly Ripa took over and you know for Kathy Lee and, and it became yeah. uh, Live with Regis, she was still doing All My Children. She was doing Regis and Kelly every day, and they gave her a primetime sitcom. Oh, yeah, it's called Hope and Faith. Yeah. Hope and Faith. She was doing all three of those simultaneously. Insane. <laughs> that's, that's the thing, though, because um, I think the problem is you can never, once you're part of the soap family, you can never leave. You just can't leave it. You know, you feel like it's the family behind if you go and do something else. Oh, what's the scrape? Is your phone scraping on something? Um, I don't think so. That's so. That's so strange. You can edit all the sound. Yeah. Is that no? Better? But this is this is really strange. Oh yeah, there we go. That's um, good. I yeah. What was I saying? I think it's she probably stayed on because it's the pro- The thing about uh, daytime is the ensemble feeling. Mm-hmm. And you don't really want to leave it behind. That's just my thing. Well, I think it's that. I think it's, again, the only, you know, once upon a time, you know, before anyone knew soaps were really in danger, it's like the only thing that you can, I think I think it's a quality of life, right? Yeah. Especially if you're like married and have children, it's, it's yeah. really, the, it's a nine to five job, you know, yeah. it's the only acting job is a nine to five job. I think the steady income. And I think it's, you know, because again, you leave a soap, you can go out and become a big success or you could go out and fail. Yeah. Um, and um, as some people, I, I have a friend who told me a story about uh, Cameron Matheson. <laughs> so he was like doing his thing and he was, um, you know, ready to leave and go and go out to Hollywood and be a star. But, you know, he, he can't act. He's doing exactly what he should be doing. He's hosting a morning show now, but can't act. And apparently everyone in the writer's room knew it. So they specifically (laughs) wrote him out going off on a motorcycle knowing, and sure enough, like a year later, he came back to town on that exact same motorcycle that he he left on. (laughs) And, And I think it's that, right? You can leave and you could be, uh, you know, a total, your career might not take off in the way that you were. And yeah. if you're not like this, you know, really iconic soap character, you know, you're recast or the soap world moves on without yeah. you. So I think there's also that too. It's like, do I stay? Do I go? And I think there is a point that after um, after you are on a soap for a specific period of time, it, you're pigeonholed. You're a soap actor, and maybe you can get TV movies, but like no one is really looking at you for feature films. No one's really so. It's kind of like, you know, yeah. like I remember reading an interview when um, Ron Moss left um, Bold and Beautiful. Oh. I can only imagine he must have like they must have offered him like a pay cut or so. That, that's the only reason I can imagine him leaving. But I remember an interview, you know, they're like, so now, you know, what do you want to do now that you, you know, uh, are leaving the soaps? And remember he like had a band that was like, they had a big hit yeah. player. And he was like, you know, yeah. again, he, you know, he's on the show for like 25 years. It's in, he's not the greatest actor in the world. And he, I remember he was like, you know, I just, I believe in dreaming big. I'm hoping to maybe work with Martin Scorsese or maybe and it was just like, dude, <laughs> like, <laughs> Go back to Forrester Creations, yeah. pronto. <laughs> that was just um, yeah, because he's he's like the him and Drake Hogerston are kind of like the the cliched soap actor yeah caricatures, you know. In terms of, their, I think they're very they must be they're very nice men probably, but they're kind of like when people want to give examples of kind of soap opera acting, so to speak. Yeah. Drake or Ron Moss. I remember there was an episode. I don't know. Did did the show Talk Soup air in the UK? I didn't think so. Okay, it was a show on the E Network, and basically, they did, so it started back in the '90s when like there was this proliferation of daytime talk shows. Yes. And so it was hosted by a comedian, and they would take all of like the funniest and the best clips from all the daytime talk shows. As daytime talk shows went the way of the dodo, they um. Uh, just started incorporating just 
things that were great on TV and it became a weekly show. And there is, I have to find it and I'm going to send it to you. There is a clip. They were making fun of the Bulls and the Beautiful. And this one scene where Rick, I think, was in the hospital. And the way the script was written, he said Rick's name something like 25 times. And so it was just a mashup of him going, Rick, 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 Rick. Brilliant. I'm going to try to find it and send it to you. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just thinking about um, it, it's so funny. Don't you love when characters have kind of catchphrases? Yeah. Like, like Sheila used to go, God, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> she used to be like her brain. <laughs> she felt she was so self pitying. Totally. Poisoning Stephanie with mercury or. <laughs> Throwing a shrink out of a window. I know that. <laughs> but, oh my God, that was the she. She might have been the greatest villain in soap history, uh, honestly. So underrated. I think she should have won an Emmy. She should have done. Um, and I think that the problem with they, they never knew how to write the character for later years. Mm-hmm. Each of that character always play into the fact that she feels like she's doing the right thing, even when she's doing horrible things. It's always to it's always for an objective like totally but see this is one of the this is one of the things i think again why soaps get a bad rap and it's something they do is just like in real life just because the story doesn't end doesn't mean that the character should always be there like at the end of that storyline that should have been the end of sheila forever that should have been and just go down as this was this crazy woman who came into our lives and one of the most memorable yeah. times, as opposed to, because also, just realistically, if someone tries to kill you, kidnap your baby, all of this, are you then going to still interact with them? It was, it was actually, you know, when she has the goodbye party, where she holds the gunpoint, and then Lauren talks to her, and she suddenly realizes what she's done, and she drinks the poison, she was, that she was supposed to die, and, that was, and she says, she's actually dying in Eric's arms, and she says, all I wanted was to be loved, or something. Oh, and that was that was the key, and she was supposed to die, but Kimberlyn was so popular and didn't want to leave daytime, obviously, because of the security. They wrote her back in. But she nope. is, narrative, narratively speaking, Sheila is supposed to, that's supposed to be the end. And it would have worked, you know. And I feel like a character like Phyllis shouldn't, shouldn't have lasted as long as she has. You mm-hmm. know? Um, she, she's not like a character like Nikki. She doesn't have like a huge kind of, She's not the center of the family, you know. Right. Uh, but I suppose because Michelle Staff is a good actress, they would shoot her. But, but in a way, I remember having this idea. Um, imagine having like a soap where it's like a repertory theatre company and every year they change, the, the actors change character and they play a different role to what they played the year before. But like the same char- like the same characters, but like swapping it up. Like last yeah. year I played Erica, and this year I'm gonna play whoever. Yeah, it's like a new. So last year I played the rich tycoon. This year I'm gonna play someone that's really struggling in a different. You know country. that actually. Can I tell you? Yeah. Ooh, you just gave me an idea. We have to talk about this offline. You just gave me a really brilliant idea. Yeah. All right. <laughs> put a pin in that put a pin in that I don't, I don't want to talk about this publicly you okay. just gave me a really awesome idea um oh my god yeah well i could talk about soaps all day i don't want to keep you too long but i do want to know a little bit more about your um your your uh, your thesis well basically um it was called contemporary art in the liminal space refuge for the divine and empirical world and i'm basically arguing that um the spiritual life or the, the idea of the sacred or the divine is not the exclusive, um, does not belong just to like organized religion. To say mm-hmm. when you walk to a church, you think this is a divine space. Right. The argument is that the divine can be kind of evoked in a liminal situation. And a lim- liminality is that point between. Um, is the is the kind of um, the corridor between status points. So it's mm-hmm. when life is up in the air. 